Today we're looking at making a weekly agenda. If you followed along with our previous videos, you'll know that this is the hub of information for us. It provides everything students need for the week. Now, I've created one for the first week of school, which is a little bit lighter than usual, but I've included pretty much everything you need to know how to do in order to be able to do this on a weekly basis. My preference is to label my weeks. I set it up so that at the top I have the ongoing weekly assignments so I don't have to duplicate them every day, and then I have the weekdays, and I always like to end with a looking ahead at what's coming next week. Let me show you how I set up my graphics. Much of what I do here is similar to what I did in the first video of creating a Canvas homepage, so I won't go over everything that I do because it's very similar to what's there. But you can see I choose fonts and a color palette, and then I do this in PowerPoint so that I can reuse the template and just change out the font and colors. This is also helpful because I have a tendency to forget what fonts I have used. As you're copying and pasting to create your days of the week, um, whether it's within the same week or changing your font, what you want to make sure that you do is you recenter um, after you change the font. Then, as we did with the home page, we need to save these grouped items as a picture so that we can upload them to Canvas. As I'm saving all of these, what I like to do is change my font and color palette every week. And the reason is that one, I like the difference. <laughs> I like to be able to differentiate between the weeks. I also like to make my color palette reflective of the season, but I could see keeping the same font font, the same color palette, and just changing your dates every week, and that being helpful for students as well. I think overall, as long as whatever you're using looks the same every week, students find it easy to navigate. I'm going to start uploading my graphics. The first way that I'm going to show you is something I don't like, and then I'll show you how I fixed it. I don't know if it's the right way to fix it, but it's the only way I figured out how to do it. So at this this is the same as what we did with the home page, so I won't go over it all again. I will point out that I like my agenda to be fairly small. On the student screen, it's completely readable, it's not teeny tiny, but um, I find that when you make it really large, it becomes a little overwhelming, and I think we all feel whenever we have to scroll through anything that we can get a little overwhelmed. I have these two images, and what I want you to notice is the amount of space between them. It's pretty big. Now, if you don't care about the scroll, then you don't really need to do anything, but I'm trying to minimize it. So what I do is I open up my PNG file, and then I go ahead and I crop the image. Now, I'm not sure if there's a, another way to do this, but again, just through trial and error, this is what was easiest for me. If you've not ever done this before, when you open the PNG file, then you're just going to click on the image and a little plus will appear. And then you'll drag across your trackpad to create a rectangle over the shape. And then it's not like a screenshot. You do have a chance to change the sizing and the positioning. And then you're going to do command K on a Mac or control K on a PC and clip your image. So I'm going to go back and delete these original images and now we'll put in our cropped images and see what the difference is. Like I said, if you're not concerned about the size or you want to have a larger agenda, then this isn't something that you need to do. But if you're looking to sort of keep it smaller, then this is a helpful trick. And you'll see when I get both of the images back in here that they are much closer together, which is going Going to be helpful in, again, minimizing that scroll. We're also teachers who like to change our margins to a half inch instead of an inch, so I guess we're going to try and squeeze everything we can into the smallest possible space. You'll notice that I'm changing the size of everything. This is something I went over in the second Canvas homepage video, and I'll include those linked for you. So you can see how much smaller everything is. Now I'm going to add in 
all of my other graphics. The reason why I like to do this as opposed to building it in its entirety as I go along is so that I can sort of gauge the size of all the images. I can tell you from experience, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday can be the same size, but Wednesday and Thursday need a little bit of adjusting in order to stay consistent. Now, as I'm uploading these, I'm changing the image size to small just so that I can see everything close to how I want it to look. Once you get accustomed to doing this, you can automatically set your image size, make it customized. I know that for myself, I typically like to use 100 for my weekdays and then I scale up for Wednesday and Thursday. This might be a case for using the same font the entire year, but it does get pretty quick once you are familiar with the routine. It's sort of like writing on your whiteboard. When you first start teaching, you can't fit anything anywhere. You write on an angle and then after a while, you just figure it out. So you can see I'm going in and changing the image size. And again, this is something that just takes a little bit of finagling and figuring out what works for you and the way you want your agenda to look. It's really easy. Um, and like I said, once you've got it figured out, for the most part, you can use the same image size every week. If you're getting free, font, free fonts, say that five times fast, from the font, Sometimes you may need to mess with it a little bit. Some fonts are really gigantic, but otherwise it's just a matter of a, a couple of weeks of trial and error and then you get into your rhythm. After I have everything set, I like to save just so I don't lose any of my hard work. Next, we're going to look at the ongoing weekly assignments and how I set those up. The nice thing about ongoing weekly assignments is that basically this is a copy and paste every week. So I only have to set it up once and then change my links once in a while. At the beginning of the year, I'll create pages that have the login information, but as the year progresses and everybody's logged in, then I will just direct the students directly to the site, which is what I'm showing you here with typing club. So for Quill, I was showing you how I do it at the beginning of the year. And then we're also going to look at how to embed activities so that students don't even have to leave the Canvas website. And then we'll finish off by looking at how to set up a Nearpod assignment. Let's start by looking at the quill assignment. I'm showing you here what I do at the beginning of the semester for the first two or three weeks. This is where I create a page within Canvas that has the login information and it's linked for the students so that I don't have to worry about them getting confused. I'm going to show you again here what I do with the graphics, but I won't explain it. So um, if you need a tutorial on that I will include in the description box the link to the homepage video. This is once again how I make the images smaller so that I don't have lots of extra space on my documents. I have my graphics ready and now I'm going to create a new page and this is what I will link to my agenda so that students have their login information embedded within the link. I found for my students, if I ask them to copy and paste, lots of times there's some confusion, but if I embed it within a link, and not every platform gives you that opportunity, but when it is available, then I take advantage of it. You can see I'm uploading my graphics here just like I did for the weekly agenda banner and days of the week. So now I have my text in the page and I'm gonna go ahead and change the font. I don't usually do this, usually I just keep it at the default font, but I just wanted to show you how easy it is to change the font. And then if I had like six class periods, I would probably set this up as a table, but it's just three class periods. So I'm going to go ahead and just 
keep them together, not separate anything out with a table and hope that my students pay enough attention that they know what class period they are in. I am gonna center it so it stands out a little bit more. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to add the external link. And again, this is the link that is specific to this particular class period. As more platforms are becoming sort of conscious of and wanting to integrate with LMSs, the more opportunity you have to have these unique links to a particular class period. Then you go ahead and repeat the process for the other class periods that you have. And then I'm gonna come back on my weekly agenda and now I'm going to link to a course link and I'm going to link to the page that I made. Once again, this is not something that I do all year long. After the first couple of weeks or everybody signed up, then I go ahead and switch it to just go to the website. So with my next example, I'm showing how I link directly to a website. And actually Typing Club is the reason why I started including these links. If you go to typingclub.com, you create your own account and you have limited access if your teacher has made an account for you then that's a special address and I needed students to go to that address rather than the one that came up on Google and the easiest way for me to do that was by including an external link to exactly where I wanted them to go by far the easiest part of the agenda to set up now we're going to take a look at embedding an activity from an external website directly into Canvas, which means that students don't have to leave the platform. So what we're going to do is look at how we create and get that embed and put it into a page on Canvas that can be linked to in the agenda. I'm going to start by making a new page. I will say I do delete these pages. Typically after two weeks, I'll delete delete them. You don't even have to keep them for two weeks because otherwise your number of pages gets a little overwhelming and it's not necessary to keep them, especially if it's something that's going to be closed, which a Kahoot expires after a certain amount of time. So I put in my text and then I need to go to the Kahoot website and I am going to set up my challenge and get it all started. And then I'm going to get a link. Now, if I didn't want to keep the students on Canvas, I would just include this link as an external link like we did with Typing Club. But because I want them to stay on Canvas, I'm going to instead create it as an embed code. So I'm gonna copy the link and head over to an embed code generator. I'll include that linked in the description box. And then I don't, for this, need to change any of the settings. I'm just gonna put in that link and create the code and then I will come back to canvas and click insert and then it says embed pretty easy and just put that in after I do that it will show up for me and I find that with something like Kahoot which is just flashcards it doesn't take up a lot of real estate on the screen so that's something that's pretty easy to embed if it's something like say a Google Doc I'm probably not going to want to embed that for students to work on. Now I just need to go back to my agenda page and link the page to the document. Very easy, it's just a course link now because it's its own page. And then I redo that process for each of the other cahoots that I've assigned for the week. Let's move on to the next weekly assignment, which is a first chapter Friday, and we use the Nearpod platform for those. And so we need to sync up our Nearpod account with our Canvas account. It's relatively easy to do. It just takes a couple of steps. We want to sync Canvas and Nearpod so that Nearpod will deliver the scores directly to Canvas for us and save us a little bit of time and effort. Before we can create the assignment, we need to sync 
Nearpod with Canvas. So what we're going to do is at the bottom of our toolbar menu, we're going to click on settings, then apps and search Nearpod. Click Nearpod and add app. Now I already have Nearpod installed, so I'm going to show you exactly how you do this when we do Edpuzzle. But you're going to need a consumer key and a secret code, and I'll leave in the description box the link for where to find that information. Once you have that and you've installed the app, then you need to click on Nearpod on that toolbar just to make sure that your account is now synced. We're all ready to set up the assignment, so we're going to go to our assignment tab, click add assignment. I can either use that blue button and it assigns overall and I have to make a selection as to the group that it goes to, or I can click within the group, the type of assignment that I want to include. It just saves one step. I'm going to give the assignment a name, select a due date, assign a point value, and then I need to go to more options. When I do that, I have the opportunity to add a description for the assignment. I also have the chance to say, I don't want this to count for the overall grade. Again, we don't put all of our grades in Canvas, so it's not an accurate representation, so better to have nothing. <laughs> and then I'm also going to link up that assignment to Nearpod. I'm gonna click external tool, search Nearpod, and then I'll go to my Nearpod library. This allows me to select from amongst all of my Nearpod assignments so that I can assign an activity to students through Canvas rather than through, through Canvas and Nearpod or just Nearpod but explain on Canvas what they need to do. I want students to be able to see this full screen so I'm going to load it on another tab. For most assignments, I like to make them accessible to students at the beginning of the week, so I set it to open when school starts on Monday morning. I also accept late work until the end of the grading period, so I keep the assignments open until that time. Canvas will let you know when an assignment is submitted late. It's very clearly marked on the assignment as well as on your gradebook screen, so you don't have to remember who submitted what when. Now I'm all ready to link this assignment up to my weekly agenda. To do that I'm going to highlight the part that I want to be considered the assignment link, click on the link button, course links, and then this isn't a page it's an assignment so I'll click on assignment and then I go find it in the list and it's linked up ready for students to access. We're all done with our ongoing weekly assignments. You learned so much. Now we are ready to work on our weekday agenda. So what's unique each day of the week. Now, again, this is the first week of school, so there's not a lot here. And I have included some links in the weekdays that I wouldn't typically once students are familiar with the routine. We will take a look at syncing Edpuzzle with Canvas. It's very similar to Nearpod. And then we'll finish up the weekday part by looking at how to sync up your Google account with Canvas so that you can assign your Google Doc assignments to students in Canvas. Just as we did with Nearpod, we first have to install the Edpuzzle app. Now I have to say, in my opinion, Edpuzzle is the most seamless integration. You do the same thing that you did with Nearpod. So you go to settings, apps, and then you're going to search for Edpuzzle and add app. Then as I mentioned with Nearpod, you're going to get a consumer key and a shared secret box pop-up and you need to get that information. In Edpuzzle, it's very easy. You just click on your profile icon, then click on your name, then 
go to school and then scroll down to the LMS, so to Canvas, and it provides those keys for you. You copy and paste them into Canvas and then you're able to add the app. Do the same as you did with Nearpod where you click on the label on the left hand side just to make sure that the sync is complete. Once you've done that, you're all ready to set up your assignment. So once again, you're going to click on assignments on the left hand side, and then I like to go to the category or the group that it's going to be a part of, and then you can start filling in your basic information, or you can just click more options right away fill in your information for the assignment. I always like to include a little explanation, even if it's not particularly necessary or meaningful, I just think it's helpful to have. Then click on external tool for assignment submission type. Now you're going to find Edpuzzle and it works very much the same way that Nearpod does. It will show you your library in Edpuzzle and you will be able to select something that you would like to assign to your students. Fill out the rest of the assignment information and you are ready to add your link to your weekly agenda. You add that link in exactly the same way you've added all of the others. I think that's why I like this so much because everything is accessible from one single page. The next thing we're going to take a look at is assigning a Google Doc or a Google Slides assignment. It is what is going to make you think, why did I ever spend so much time at a copy machine? It's super easy, super helpful. Students submit right from their Google Doc. It's very easy. Although I will say Google has made it a touch more difficult, but we'll take a look at that. So as I have done with everything else, we need to sync up our Google account with our Canvas account. Now to be clear, you only do this when you set up the class. You don't ever have to worry about it again until you have a new class. But you're going to go to external apps and put in Google. Now when you click add app, it's going to give you a bunch of information about having an LTI and syncing with Google. Google and doing something on Google's side. To be honest, I think that that might be Google kind of putting up some roadblocks because they don't necessarily want to help people use Canvas. So I'm going to include a link in the description box for you that will enable you to set up Google all on your own. If you have an LTI, then your administrator will have set it up already for you. The problem is sometimes I know in my school district is that our administrator for Canvas is somebody at the district office, not somebody who is at my site and quickly responsive. So the link that I'm including in the description box will give you the consumer key and shared secret so you can set up Google all on your own, which means you'll follow the same steps as we did for Nearpod and Edpuzzle. Creating an assignment with a Google submission is basically the same as Nearpod and Edpuzzle. So you set up your assignment and what is different is where the external tool for submission goes. So you can do this sort of brief setup here or you can click on more options and include things like an explanation. But what we wanna pay attention to right now is that external uh, submission type tool. So we're gonna click on that and Google Cloud Drive, not Google LTI, unless you have LTI. And then it essentially shows you your Google Drive and enables you to select an assignment from there. So as with Google Classroom, it's going to create forced copies of all the assignments that you assign from your drive. I would encourage you to have this open in another um, tab. That makes it a lot easier, but otherwise it's exactly the same as the other assignment submission types.
Then we're ready to link up the assignment in the weekly agenda, set it up exactly as we have the other links. Again, this is what makes a good Canvas agenda so helpful. We wrap up our weekly agenda with looking ahead. In this section, we include what is on tap for next week. We're going to look at how to use rubrics in Canvas, oh so helpful, and we're also going to take a look at how to embed a Google Doc. This is especially helpful if you're including information that may change or that you have to update frequently. Let's start by looking at how to embed a Google Doc in your Canvas. Now, I always like to create a separate page for my embedded Google Docs, unless it is really short. As I've mentioned before, we tend to want to keep our agendas smaller, so we prefer to use links. So you're going to create whatever the document is, and then once you're done with it, you're going to need to get a link. To do that, click on File, Share, Publish to Web, and then you're going to be tempted to get the embed code because that seems like it would make sense. But unless you know how to change the size of the image of the embed, you're probably going to want to take the link instead. So take the link, go to your iframe embed code generator. Again, that's linked in the description box. For this one, I'm going to change the width to 175, so it's bigger. And then I'm going to copy the code, go back and create a new page where I will put my embedded document. Here, you'll click insert embed and copy your code and submit. You can see where we've changed the size. If you don't do that, you end up with a very small document. So this one doesn't have to be particularly large, but sometimes you will need to change that setting in the iframe generator. Now I'm ready to go and add this link to my weekly agenda. As old pros now at adding links, it's super easy. We're going to go highlight the text that we want to turn into a link. Click the links in our toolbar. This is going to be a course link. It's a page. Find our page, click on it, and we are done with that. The last big thing we'll be looking at is adding a rubric to an assignment. It isn't as complicated as it sounds, and once you do make it, it's very easy to carry with you from course to course and year to year. So it's worth the effort to make a rubric. Start by clicking Add Rubric. Now, I prefer to make my rubrics in a separate document and then just copy and paste them in, but you could absolutely just make your rubric within Canvas. I'm going to start by copying and pasting over the criteria. Now, you have an option to add additional um, longer description. If whatever your criteria name is, is not super clear, I would definitely encourage you to add that. But for this particular rubric, it's not necessary. Then I'm going to edit the first ratings column. The point value is the same, but the title is different. So I'll need to change the title and I'm going to copy and paste in the description for this particular rating. Click update rating. Now I need to click the little blue plus button because I need to add another rating category. So this one I'll have to generate all on my own and I will copy and paste in the description, change the value and the title, and then update. I'll follow this exact same procedure for the last rating category. Then I need to add the next criterion. I click criterion and then it gives me the option for new criterion or duplicate. Because I'm going to have the same number of ratings labeled the same and worth the same amount of points, the easiest thing to do is click duplicate. 
I'm going to do the same thing for this criterion that I did for the one before. So I'm just going to copy and paste in the information that's relevant for these categories. I'm going to do the same thing for the remaining two criterion that I have left in my rubric. The nice thing about this, and most people create their rubrics fairly square or rectangular, however, because you are creating it in this way, if for something you wanted to have four different rating categories or you only wanted to have two rating categories it's really easy to do now granted it will look a little bit wonky when you look at it but students aren't going to really look at it that way they're going to look at their overall score so it'll just be you and actually when you are in the process of scoring it it's not going to be that noticeable even to you so once you create this rubric, you can use it as a template to create other rubrics. You don't always have to start from zero, especially if your rubrics tend to look similar. Also, sometimes if you're using Canvas through your school district or your school, you can often find rubrics that are published by your school or your school district if you have a standardized rubric. You can see this is what your rubric will look like when you're done. You're very rarely going to see it in this form though because it's not how you see it in your grading screen. Now that the rubric is complete, we're ready to create an assignment. Now, when you create an assignment and you want to add a rubric to it, you have to do something a little bit different. And I will admit that I had to consult the Canvas help desk in order to be able to do this the first time. So when you're doing this, you want to set up your assignment as a no submission assignment. If you attach it to an external tool, you cannot add a rubric. So set up your assignment as no submission, save it, and then you have the option to add a rubric. It's kind of strange, <laughs> but once you figure that out, it's very easy. Then you just select the rubric that you want to use for that particular assignment. Assignment, click use this rubric which you may need to make your window larger for and then you can go back and edit the assignment and include the submission whether it's like in this case a Google Doc or it's linked to Edpuzzle or Nearpod or whatever it is that you are going to be assessing with that particular rubric. The last thing I want to show you with this assignment is how to assign to a select number of students and and having a varied number of due dates. So you can see from my Google Doc that I have five or so students who turn in this assignment every week over the course of six weeks, rather than assign it to everyone at one time and it getting lost amongst the shuffle. What I do is assign to a particular group of students every week. So I get rid of everyone in the assigned to, and I put in just that group of students' names. I can specialize their due date to their particular week. I can make it so that they don't see the assignment until it's the week their assignment is due. And I can continue to add groups by clicking add at the bottom. This will stop some students from asking you every single week if their assignment is due. It takes a few extra minutes at the beginning of the grading period, but it's a lifesaver in the long run. P.S. The names auto-populate so you don't have to type out the whole thing. Let's end off with something pretty easy since we've been challenging ourselves, and it's this. Sometimes the easiest thing to do is just make yourself a page, add a nice banner, and then type everything you need directly onto that page. So to do this, I create a new page and then I have created in PowerPoint, like I do for all of my other banners, a title for this page. This is the kind of page I like to create when doing an embed seems like overkill. But for this, I update it every week. I look at it frequently. 
I want it to look nice. So I put in my banner and then for this page, it's a list of book titles and I am linking it to our online library access. This is an easy way for my students to come and find book titles that we've talked about over the course of the semester. So if it's going to be something easier for them, easier for you, keeping it simple is sometimes better. So there you have it. Can you believe it? We're done, finally. One of the things that I like most about doing this is that it's really beneficial for me because I'm always one week ahead. This means that I am never rushing at the last minute to finish something. I can work on the next week's agenda all throughout the current week. It's also, as I've said many times, so helpful for students because it's a one-stop shop. They can find everything they need. Hopefully you found this video to be as successful as my students find the agenda. Ha <laughs> ha. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments down below. See you soon. Bye. Oh, and don't forget to hit publish on everything. If you don't, Nobody will see anything.